Welcome and uh, good evening on this uh, wintry night. Uh, my name is Robert Dijkgraaf, Director of the Institute for Advanced Studies. It's a great pleasure to uh, this uh, annual lecture on public policy, a, a series that uh, addresses issues of broad, important, relevant to contemporary politics, social conditions, and scientific matters. Uh, as always, at the end of the lecture, there will be a Q&A period, and then we'll have a reception in the common room of Fuld Hall. So we're absolutely delighted that uh, today we have a very distinguished speaker, Barbara Arnwein, President and Executive, Executive Director of the Laureus Committee for Civil Rights and the Law uh, since uh, 1989. Uh, Barbara is known for her contributions on s critical justice issues, including the passage of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1991 and the 2006 reauthorization reauthor of provisions of the Voting Rights Act. She has been fe featured commentor commentator on many, many national media outlets, uh, including MSNBC's The Daily Rundown, CNN's Legal View, and most recently, in fact, last week, she appeared uh, on the Reid Report to discuss the qualifications and impact of Loretta Lynch, who's President Obama's uh, nominee for Attorney General. Under her, her leadership, the Laureus Committee continues to participate in monitoring treaty compliance and reporting to reports written by the United States regarding the requirement of both the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination following the United Nations Human Rights Council Universal Periodic Review. She is a champion of civil rights and racial justice issues nationally and internationally. Just telling me of our trip, for instance, to Brazil, where some of you were too. In the areas of housing and lending, community development, employment, voting, education, and environmental justice. Barbara's work also includes women's rights, immigrants' rights, judicial diversity, criminal justice reform, racial profiling, healthcare disparities, and LBGTQ rights. Barbara is a prominent leader of the Election Protection, the nation's largest nonpartisan Voter Pro Protections Coalition launched in 2004 to assist historically disenfranchised persons to exercise the fundamental right to vote. She received her doctoral degree from Duke University School of Law in 1976 after graduating from Scripps College in 1973. She received numerous national, regional, and local awards including the National Bars Association's Vince Monroe Townsend Jr. Legends Award, 2014, and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, Hubert H. Humphrey Civil and Human Rights Award in 2013. She's the board vice chair of the National Coalition to abolish the death penalty and serves on the board of directors of Moms Rising and Independent Sector. She's an honorary board member of Welcome.us and she's also a member of the American Bar Association section of individual rights and responsibilities. In today's lecture, Barbara will discuss the, uh, will discuss the state of democracy and voting rights in the so-called post-Shelby era. She will examine the landmark case and its lasting impact on the nation. Please join me in giving a warm, warm welcome to Barbara Arnwein. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to start by saying it's a great honor to be here. I want to thank my board member and wonderful friend and change agent extraordinaire, Victoria Bjorklund, for inviting me to be here and to be part of this. What you do from everything from uh, Doctors Without Borders to so many causes is totally appreciated, and I've been thinking about you a lot watching the Ebola crisis. I also want to say to the Institute for Advanced Studies that it means a lot to be invited to give this particular lecture and on this subject, which is so critical to our nation and to the world. In this first um, Iteration, I will, you'll hear me saying next as I um, advance slides. So next, uh, for the first slide. The right to vote 
is the most fundamental right in our nation. In fact, President Lyndon B. Johnson said, this right to vote is the basic right without which all others are meaningless. It gives people, people individuals, control over their own destinies. This quote, unfortunately, does not always resonate with everyone in our society. We live in an era where the right to vote is threatened very, very strongly. That citizens can participate in the political process through an electoral system is the basic principle of our democracy. So basic, in fact, that the act of exercising that right should be free of burden and barriers. It's important to note that the American system of republicanism is based on a constitutional democracy, which means all of our rights derive from those enshrined in our constitutions and laws. But in 2014, 144 years since Congress adopted the 15th Amendment that expanded the franchise to all citizens, 50 years since the 24th Amendment banned the use of poll taxes, and 49 years since President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into law, we find ourselves looking at the current landscape of the right to vote with a troubling thought democracy should not be this hard. Next slide. This is what we're seeing in our current democracy. This is what we've seen now for several elections. Robocalls, voter intimidation, restrictive voter ID laws, proof of citizenship requirements, reduction, elimination of early voting, incorrect information, changing polling location times, reduction, elimination of same day voting, long lines, lack of modernized voting registration, correct precinct laws, felon disenfranchisement laws. They all make our democracy way too hard. That is why we must look to both historical and modern examples to answer the question of do voting rights still matter? Do we still need strong voter protection and voter education efforts in 2014, does voter suppression still exist today? The answer is a resounding yes to all those questions. And by the end of this lecture, we will have explored these ans the answers to these questions and the tremendous need for reforms to protect the right to vote. Next slide. <clears throat> As you know, the midterm elections just passed on November 4th. Voting rights champions, including grassroots organizers, voter protection volunteers and attorneys, worked steadfastly up until the eve of election day and through November 4th to right the wrongs of harmful changes to state voting laws and to lessen the impact of failures by state and local county and municipal officials that led to one voter confusion, not to mention poll worker confusion, two disenfranchisement, and three barriers to the ballot box during early voting periods and on November 4th across the country. What you're looking at is a slide of the election protection, one of our command centers. And you will see that these are lawyers and legal volunteers helping and taking questions from uh, citizens calling desperate for information about their right to vote. Of of only November 4th, we received 22,000 calls for the midterm election. Now, when you have to think about these calls, sometimes when people are calling us, it's one person calling saying, I'm at a precinct that serves 5,000 people, and it is now 8.30. The polling place should have been open at 7 o'clock, and it is not open. So you never can really quantify what the number calls mean, but I will tell you this one fact that is very important, is that in 2010, we received only 12,000 calls. So the 22,000 tells you that we received a lot more, not to mention we received several thousand in advance of the election. So voters, for all of the 
the meaning that we do about their interest in voting, we're quite concerned about this mid-year election. Background, slide five. Next slide. There we go. Um, today, we'll follow the evolution of voting rights in America to understand the history of the battle to protect, protect that right, how history repeats itself with state legislators' shameless voter suppression tactics, and what we can do to safeguard our rights in 2015 and beyond. Or, I'm always remain, reminded of Voltaire's uh, great opinion on this history repeats itself. Remember, he said, history never repeats itself, but mankind always does. And sadly, if past is prologue, when we speak of pro, uh, voting rights for racial minorities in today's United States, we see that this is, statement is unfortunately too true. Americans, America's voting rights history is both adorned by victory and marred by inequality. Next slide. In 1776, white men were granted the right to vote, but in many states, the right was restricted according to property ownership and religion. That year, think about it, in 1876, let's think about it, in 1776, that year, black males could legally vote in Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, but the constitutions of Connecticut and New Jersey had rescinded that right by the early 1800s. 80 years later, in 1856, voting rights were expanded to right males over 21 years of age, regardless of property, ownership, or religion. According to the National Archives, around 179,000 black soldiers served in the U.S. Army, and around 19,000 served in the Navy, and nearly 40,000 died for their country during the Civil War that was fought from 1861 to 1865. They went through this sacrifice because they wanted equality of treatment, and they certainly were determined to have the right to vote. Despite this sacrifice, they would have to wait years after giving their lives in hopes that their sacrifices would mean some degree of racial equality. And indeed, in 1870, the 15th Amendment was officially added to the U.S. Constitution, granting the right to vote regardless of race, color, or previous conditions of servitude. During that period that we know now as Reconstruction, around 2,000 African Americans held offices from the local level up to the U.S. Senate. About 1,500 of those public offices were seated in southern states. To break down the numbers, research compiled by, Gal by the Gallagher Learman Institute of American History shows that between 1865 and 1877, 14 black men served in the House of Representatives, six served as lieutenant governors, and more than 600 served in southern state legislatures. The states with the highest number of black state and federal legislators during Reconstruction were Louisiana and South Carolina, two states that would go out of their way to suppress the black vote post-Reconstruction. Those statistics are compelling and speak to the incredible exercise of African-American voting power during Reconstruction. The numbers also emphasize what was lost beginning in the 1890s when major voter suppression took hold of the South. What the 15th Amendment achieved during Reconstruction, we lost again at the end of this groundbreaking period when st states found new ways to suppress voting rights, including poll taxes, literacy tests, and other discriminatory tactics, as well as aggressive voter intimidation schemes, sometimes leading to bloodshed. And we got to remember that the early elements of the Klan, uh, what has become known as the Ku Klux Klan, the patrollers, as they were called, were born and given power in this decade to uh, beat, kill, and maim African Americans to keep them from exercising their rights. Indeed, in 1901, as the last Reconstruction era, Congressman George White left his post as a black man as he was driven out 
in North Carolina, he said something that would be prophetic. As he went to the well of Congress to give the last address, he said, like a phoenix, the Negro will rise again. Slice, the next line. It's also important to know that women were still barred from the ballot box as evidence in 1872 when Susan B. Anthony was arrested while trying to vote in a presidential election and Sojourner Truth was rejected at the polls in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The women's suffragists movement suffered from racial discrimination also with conservative white suffragists excluding black women from the movement, believing they would slow the progress to the polls because of their race. As a result, black women formed separate suffragist groups, speaking about voting rights in African-American newspapers and within their communities, even before her brave attempt to vote in 1872, Sojourner Truth controversially took the podium at a women's rights convention in Akron, Ohio on May 29, 1855, and delivered her pivotal, ain't I a woman, speech. Uh, a number of her white counterparts in the women's suffrage movement attempted to block her from speaking, afraid that a former slave and abolitionist would ruin the cause for women's suffrage. In 1876, the U.S. Supreme Court decision in U.S. versus Cruikshank found that American Indians were not citizens and therefore were not allowed to vote by law. Similarly, in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act denied citizenship to people of Chinese descent, effectively banning those with Chinese heritage from voting. The Dawes Act of 1887 was an inadequate and shameful response to U.S. versus Krupschank, allowing American Indians to vote only if they broke ancient and sacred tribal ties. Louisiana state legislature passed a grandfather clause in 1896, which exempted those who had the right to vote before 1867 or their direct descendants from voting barriers like taxes and tax. This effectively enfranchised more whites and disenfranchised a large percentage of African American voters in the following years as other states followed Louisiana's lead. Next slide. It wasn't until 1915. Next slide. Okay, thank you. It wasn't until 1915 that the United States Supreme Court wrote a unanimous decision in Gwen versus U.S. finding grandfather clauses to be unconstitutional. These kind of indirect voter suppression schemes were widespread among states in the decades preceding the signing of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and shamefully, they still go on today. Later, I'll talk about the intentionally discriminatory and unconstitutional voter ID law that Texas used in this year's November election. And I will, you know, expand on that. Versus the U.S. The 19th expanded voting rights to women in 1920. However, the road to the ballot box for African American women was stained by violence and intimidation. Black women spilled blood to exercise their constitutional right like in 1926 when a group of African-American women were beaten by election officials in Birmingham, Alabama, when they attempted to register to vote. Next slide. Then came the era, and we skip a lot of history, but from the post-reconstruction era to the 1960s civil rights movement, the percentage of African-American eligible voters remain low due to successful voter suppression tactics. I use the word successful because the barriers to the vote were so impassable that many African Americans found it impossible to register or to cast a ballot. To give you an example, and I want all of my mathematician and statistical friends in this audience to listen, the directions on a literacy test used in Louisiana 50 years ago in 1964 stated, do what you were told to do in each statement, nothing more, nothing less. Be careful as one wrong answer denotes failure to test. <laughs> yes, one wrong answer. 
You have 10 minutes to complete the test. Question 16 of the test was, draw a triangle, draw a triangle with a blackened circle that overlaps only its left corner. Question 21 read, print the word vote upside down, but in the correct order. <laughs> and question 29 asked test takers to write every other word in the, this first line and print every third word in the same line. Originalize smaller in first line in the, at a comma, but capitalize the fifth word that you write. This summer, a group of Harvard University students were challenged to complete the Louisiana literacy test. And I want to let you know that not one of them passed. That is the world that existed. In fact, um, there was a testimony that we had earlier this year uh, when we conducted our National Commission on Voting Rights, and a woman got up and told the story of her mom who went to take a, a, a test, a literacy test in Mississippi, and they said, uh, ma'am, how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? <laughs> and she looked at him and said, I don't know because the kind of soap we make don't make no bubbles. So, <laughs> and they just said, okay, pass her. Um, so, you know, those kind of things were unfortunately sad and true and very devastating to the African American community. Think about all the effort it took to pass these voter suppression bills in states like North Carolina, Ohio, and Texas, as well as the, that we see now in this current era and how many problems there are because of the election day disenfranchisement. Next slide. You see, I never forget, and I hope you will never forget, that the right to vote is a right that was secured by blood and that there were so many people who fought for that right for racial minorities to be able to vote. From 1963 to 1964, so many things happened. We know that SCLC began the Birmingham campaign and we know the violence of Bull Connor and his response. We know the, the police dolls, the high pressure water hoses, the beating of children. We know the entire horrible incidents in our history. We also know that, know that Dr. Martin Luther King, who was arrested in Birmingham during the campaign, wrote the now published letter from Birmingham jail. In one part of his letter, he asked, who can say that the legislature of Alabama, which set up the segregation laws, was democratically elected? Throughout the state of Alabama, all types of conniving methods are used to prevent Negroes from being registered voters, and there are some counties without a single Negro registered vote, the fact, despite the, the fact that the Negroes constitute a majority of the population. Can any law set up in such a state be considered democratically structured? But then, tragically, in June of 1963, Megger Evers, the field secretary for the NAACP was assassinated as he returned home from a voter registration drive. And it broke, it was a heartbreaking moment. And I want to tell you, without his sacrifice, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, which I lead, would not exist because it was in response to his death that President John F. Kennedy convened the lawyers at the White House in the East Room on June 21st, 1963, and asked what is now the famous question of where are the lawyers in this fight? And fortunately, our organization was created as a private civil rights legal organization out of that sacrifice. Then in August of 1963, hundreds of thousands of people joined in the March on Washington. We know that that's where the famous I Have a Dream speech was rendered. 
September that year, there was a bombing of the Birmingham 16th Street Church. This violence also foreshadowed the violence that would follow during the Mississippi Freedom Summer. It wasn't until January 1964 that the 24th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution banned poll taxes. By February, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, had started planning the Mississippi Summer Project. The project's goal was to carry out massive voter registration drives and voter education campaigns in a state where African Americans were weakly represented on the voter rolls, with just 6.7% of Mississippi African Americans being registered to vote. The violence that ravaged Mississippi in response to this nonviolent voting rights campaign shocked the nation as people saw brutal images in newspapers and on the TV. But I want to say that one of the things I am so grateful for is that you probably have seen the announcement that President Obama is going to give posthumously the Presidential Medal of Freedom to Swerner, Cheney, and Goodman, who were murdered during that Freedom Summer. And that is the kind of recognition that all of us need to keep in mind as we think about how we go from where we are now to the future. Civil Rights Act of 1964 tried to address voting rights. In Title I and in Title VIII of the Act, it had a ban on discriminatory practices in voter registration, and the Census Bureau was also directed to collect data on re voter registration and voting statistics based on race and other factual factors. Nevertheless, John Lewis and so many others said, that's too weak a bill. And so you may recall that on March 7, 1965, one of the most pivotal moments in voting rights history occurred at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, known as Bloody Sunday, when an estimated 600 voting rights advocates attempted a brave march from Selma to Montgomery to peacefully show support for fair and strengthened voter protections for African Americans. The blood spilt on the bridge was, the hands, was at the hands of 150 state troopers who bru bru brutally beat down the nonviolent marchers. Democracy never would have come at the risk of one's life. You know what? I actually have now gone to that bridge a couple of times. And you know what always shocks me when I go to the Pettus Bridge is that I walk up, you know, in these reenactments, and I walk up to the, to the pinnacle of the bridge to the to its apex and you see down and you look down that bridge and you realize it's about a good block of still walking to do and I think about those men and women who stood on that bridge and saw at the bottom of that bridge the state troopers beating their batons, saying we're going to hurt you. Come on, bring it. We're ready. And I never in my life can answer the dramatic question of would I have been able to have kept marching on like they did into that battlefront, knowing they were unarmed, unprotected, and that there was nothing but savagery about to be unleashed on them. That kind of courage is the fundamental spirit that underlies the drive for voting rights. So when the Congress, next slide, enacted the Voting Rights Act, next slide, next slide, yes. When Congress in, in re when it enacted the Voting Rights Act in 1965, one of the things it did that was radical was it created what was called Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Frankly, nothing like this exists anywhere in the world that I've been able to, to establish. And that was an act that said before you can make any change to your election laws or your election practices, that they have to be reviewed to make sure that they're non-discriminatory. 
It was the only act I know of that prevents discrimination from occurring by making sure that a practice is not discriminatory in effect and in purpose. And that act is what became the subject, this pre-clearance requirement, where only you could submit these changes for review only to the U.S. Attorney General at the Department of Justice or to the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia for pre-clearance. Section 2, of course, of the Act prohibited states and their political subdivisions from imposing standards, practices, or procedures that result in the denial or infringement upon the right to vote. In other words, that's the part of the Act that where you can sue a state after they've done the damage. Section 3, or sue a jurisdiction after it's done the damage. Section 3 contains a bail-in provision, and Section 8 allows for the assignment of federal observers. Section 11 prohibits the interference of voting rights through the use of threats, intimidation, or coercion. Section 203 required jurisdictions with a significant number of voters with limited English proficiency to provide language assistance. And Section 208 required assistant as a result, assistance to persons and individuals as a result of blindness, disability, or the inability to read or write. All of these provisions were critical. And what was the most critical to Section 5 was Section 4, which outlined the covered jurisdictions that had been found to have a history of voting rights discrimination. And let me be very clear, there were 12,000 jurisdictions that had this history, county, city, state, and it was mainly Southern, but it was also parts of New York, parts of California, parts of Illinois, all were part of the Voting Rights Act Section 4 coverage. But we know that as a result of that act, that African American voting in the Southern states increased by 43%. We know that 10,000 African American elected officials were elected within the first decade of the act. We know that all of this resulted in huge and significant voter reform. We also know that the act was reauthorized several times by different presidents, including Presidents Nixon, Reagan, and of course, in 2006, by President Bush. And we know that because of the act, that from 1901, when George White said, the phoenix, that like a phoenix, the Negro shall rise again, that in 1972, the first African American was elected to Congress again. All of this because of the power of the, the act. But then all of a sudden, in 2000, everything changed. All of this voting power, all of this reassertion of the right to vote suddenly hit a roadblock. And it was called the 2000 presidential election. Many of us remember it. And how you know, most people think about it as the hanging chad problem, the, you know, the uncorrelated ballots, uh, all of those problems. But those overshadowed two major problems that marred the 2000 presidential election. Because we filed suit, the Lawyers Committee did, in what is called the NAACP versus Harris case, because what most people didn't know was that Florida had a ban on ex-felons voting. And what they decided to do was to create a matching system where they created that if you had the name of James Johnson, what they decided to do was to make sure that you couldn't vote if you were an ex-felon of that name. But they decided that instead of just looking for the James Johnson, that Jimmy Johnson, Jim Johnson, James E. Johnson, James E. Johnston, all of these people would be barred from voting, so they used an overbroad matching system. 
And that system, we estimate, resulted in 91,000 votes being lost. Uh, I will never forget, as long as I live, when we went to Florida, because we went to Florida the day of the election, and I'll never forget a grandma who brought, sat there with her baby and told us that she had voted for 50 years, never been arrested, never even seen the inside of a police station, and that she was told when she took her five-year-old granddaughter to show her how to vote, that she was told that she was an ex-felon and was denied the right to vote. That is the debacle that happened. We won that case, but think about this. The decisive ele element in the Florida election was the exclusion of 31% of African-American men either through prison or among the more than 400,000 ex-offenders permanently disenfranchised in that state. We know from studies that were done that more than 200,000 potential black voters were excluded from the polls during that election. And we also know that, there, that, uh, that this was the infamous case decision that even though most of us only know it for who won, that this was the case that also stated the principle that voting for president of the U.S. was a privilege granted by the laws of the states. Moving forward, the question for us is how do we reconcile this conflict that's existing in our country between our democracy and our demographics? Because what we're seeing now in this modern era is the rise of voter suppression because of the changing demographics of the United States. As a significant block of, color, of people of color, especially Latinos and blacks, become even more prominent voters. There are two articles I recommend to you. One is by Ben Jealous, and he has a great article that's out that he published this uh, summer on, it's called True South, and it's called The Power of the Black Belt Voting. And look at that study. There's another one that just came out October 31st by Maya Harris uh, that's also called the, it's also called uh, the Strength of the, uh, the, strength of the vo uh, Voting of Women of Color. And it's definitely one that you need to look at. These are two great ones. Uh, next slide. Next slide. All of these things. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. I know. I'm notorious. That's why I always have other people do this for me. Next slide. And now I think I'm almost caught up. Two more slides. Yes. Keep on going. Keep on. Next slide, next slide. I'm coming to the end, folks. Um, two more slides. One more. Ah, one more. All right. And uh, since 2010, 22 states have passed laws restricting the right to vote, according to a recent study by the Brennan Center. These restrictions started with a wave of voter ID laws, photo ID laws, imposing obstacles for eligible voters to cast a vote, a ballot. In addition, research by the ACLU shows that since 2010, the U.S. Department of Justice has had 18 Section 5 objections to voting laws in South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Next slide. Next slide. Bam! <laughs> the map of shame. This is the state of voting rights where you see this map and how many states have instituted what we call restrictive uh, voting rights laws. The red, of course, are the worst uh, areas, and that's not, has nothing to do with party identification. 
it is totally, you know, just a color that we know works. Uh, and the yellow is the photo ID requested but not required, but it leads to nothing but confusion. This map was created in 2011 to show people what really is happening in our country with voter suppression and how many millions of voters are being affected. Next map, uh, next slide. Shelby County versus Holder, 2013, deeply divided Supreme Court. The court held that Section 4 of the VRA, which establishes the formula that I talked about for determining which jurisdictions are covered by Section 5, imposed current burdens that were not, not based upon current needs. As I mentioned prior to the Shelby decision, 12,000 jurisdictions were covered. Justice Roberts wrote the court's 5-4 decision finding Section 4 unconstitutional. He wrote, Congress, if it is to divide the states, must identify those jurisdictions to be singled out on a basis that makes sense in light of current conditions. It cannot rely simply on the past. You know what's interesting about that? Remember that map I showed you, uh, the map of shame? Not one sentence of the Shelby decision talks about modern day voter suppression. Not one sentence talks about the impact of all of these voter suppression laws that the courts were striking down right and left under section five. It's curious that if we're gonna talk about current conditions, that you have a court that did not even want to talk about the current conditions. And think about this, Congress had, by its own account, 25 hearings in the House and the Senate, had 15,000 pages of record uh, that it entered into the congressional record, but still there, the court felt it didn't do enough question becomes, what is enough? And then the court announced the standard that none of us had ever heard of in any legal jurisprudence before. The standard about the equal sovereignty of the states. And we all sat back as we read this decision and said, since when does the equal sovereignty of the states trump individual right to vote? Just Next slide. This is what was the result of this law was that these things were happening, that it caused these problems of, you know, we lost the notice of voting changes. We've been fighting for a legislative fix. There's an increased need for voter education. Restrictive voting rules and regulations have been passed. Next slide. Now here's my, hero, my shero, the notorious RBG. Justice Ginsburg's fierce dissent in Shelby said, the question in Shelby is who decides whether Section 5 remains justif justifiable, the Supreme Court or Congress, which was charged with enforcing the 14th and 15th Amendments by appropriate legislation. Remember, she says, getting rid of Section 5 because you say there aren't current voting problems of significance is like getting rid of an umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Uh, she is um, fearless. I love her. Section 5 of the Voting Rights um, Act, the loss of it has been horrible. Immediately upon the announcement of the case, we know that the states of Texas, Alabama, and Mississippi announced that they were going to proceed with their voter suppression laws. We also know, next slide, we also know that uh, the fallout has been significant. Uh, we have legal count, uh, local county boards that have gone from single member districts to at large. We know North Carolina caught, passed what was called the monster bill. We also know that Ohio passed strict voter ID laws and cut back its early voting. All of these fallouts 
in the era of the post era. And we also know that Florida used the decision to come up with a new uh, voter purging scheme that they're going to be using. So next slide. And the fight now is how do we preserve our democracy? We won a battle in Nevada to stop a voter ID law there. We won a uh, we defeated voter ID laws in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. In 2014, Minnesota and Nebraska also, we saw some good election reforms in Minnesota and Nebraska and in Massachusetts. Next slide. That leads us to what we call a map of hope. These are jurisdictions that are passing good legislative reform. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned earlier the hearings that we held. Uh, next slide. We also know that you know Texas has had this. Uh, next slide. That Texas has had this uh, horrible rule that was allowed the voter ID law that was allowed to to go into effect. I'm going to skip a lot of the great stories of people. I'm going to end on two stories and then I'm through. And I'm really appreciative of your time. And this is an original speech, so I'm just learning it, uh, the timing on it. Georgia. So I'm going to slip to, let's go next slide. There we go. And Ben Jealous' article on True South, what he says is that if you registered, 60% of the unregistered African Americans and Latinos and Asians in the South, that every single state in the South flips as far as what its state legislature would look like, what its politics would look like, and that it would be amazing transformation for the South. The New Georgia Project decided that it would take up this challenge. And they went out and they registered over, and that's a typo, over 85,000 new registrants from Georgia. Most of them young African American first time voters. They submitted these registrations to five counties. And this is in the last, all of this has happened in the last four months. The, Counties somehow decided that they wouldn't process 40,000 of these registrations. We sued the county on behalf of the New Georgia Project, the NAACP, and the Georgia State Conference. Uh, and we sued the you know, Secretary of State and the five counties. Two of the counties settled up with us before the loss, uh, lawsuit went to trial. Uh, but when we got before the judge, he did something that shows you how light we treat the right to vote. He said, well, because they process a lot of registrations, I'm going to find that the state and the counties were in substantial compliance, even though they didn't process these. And he said, and I'm hopeful they'll do it before the election. We said, Your Honor, can we put on re information? Can we put on witnesses? And he said, no. And we asked for a writ of mandamus to compel the state and those counties to do so. And he said, no. Well, guess what happened on election day? Guess in Georgia. In Georgia on election day, the state hotline, the state website that they had established, that's called the My Voter website, that was created to tell Georgians not only if they were registered, but where to vote. Remember that in our country, that because we don't have the right electoral system, that most people vote in the morning because they're trying to get to work. 60 to 70 percent of all voters vote in the morning. So what happened on that day is that that morning the website crashed. It crashed because so many people were calling, trying to find out where do I vote, 
am I registered? And the tragedy of that is shouldn't they have known that they would be, because we told them they had 40,000 at least, we now believe we were wrong. We now believe we probably were wrong by a third, that there probably are three times the number of unprocessed registrations based on the calls, based on what we saw on election day. Not only that, Georgia has what's called a correct precinct law that says if you're in the wrong voting place, you vote provisionally and that ballot's not counted. So the tragedy of this was severe and it cannot be under, underestimated how much you see this voter suppression going on. And the counties, remember I told you two settled and three didn't? They're all over the state, county lines crashed. There are telephone lines. People were not able to reach their board of elections, their county board of elections. Their phones were either constantly busy or unanswered. So that's just, and we know that our database for election protection shows a lot of calls. Moving forward, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. This is where we got to go. Voting rights has to be reformed in our democracy. First, we need to fix the problem with the Voting Rights Act by passing a new Voting Rights Amendments Act. But that won't be enough because what we need is fundamental reforms. Think about this. The most basic reform in the world that we could do here in the United States that would make all the difference in the world is just have automatic universal registration. So the minute you turn 18, you're registered. Just like the minute my son turned 18, four months later, what did he get in the mail? Selective service number. And that was only you know, a few years ago. He got his selective service number. They knew his age, they knew his address, they knew where to find him. He could have gotten a voting card. That one change, because 85% of all election suppression schemes go towards voter registration and the ability to vote on election day. Second big reform, same day registration. Because if you got a problem, you didn't register in advance or you are you had a problem with your registration, you moved, whatever, you can re-register on election day. 12 states have what we call EDR, election day registration. And they are the states with what? Not surprising, the highest voter turnout. Because it's easy to vote. And one of the things that we found in surveys of American voters is that they are so turned off by how hard it is to register to vote. I would like to point out that a lot of states, by October 15th of this year, 22 states had already cut off voter registration. And people don't realize that they have to register that early in the process. Broaden the acceptable forms of voter ID and strike down discriminatory voter ID laws. I can talk about that later. Minimum standards. Uh, for and uh, have you know early more early voting. If we could have universal early voting, it makes a big difference. Make election day a holiday. In most countries, it is. We're one of the few Western democracies that don't have election day as a national holiday. Lower voting age to 16. That's a big, huge movement all around the world right now. Have the ability to restore your rights if you are an ex-felon. Reduce long lines, engage young voters. If we do these things, our democracy would be robust. So in closing, this is a fight that will not resolve itself. Left to devices,
we will continue to have the inequities that we see in this country, where one third of all Americans are white men, yet they dominate all political seats of power, disproportionately. If we're gonna have an artificial system of governance, then we would keep up doing what we're doing now. But if we're going to expand the franchise, if we're gonna have a true America that is inclusive of all Americans in our democratic process, then this fight isn't the fight of the Lawyers Committee. This fight has to be your fight and all of our fights. Thank you so much.